Today's scripture reading is 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 17 through 23. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on mission on which the Lord has sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and, and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Have you ever flipped on the TV or scrolled through a social media feed and you caught a glimpse of a clip of a movie or a show and it was just totally out of context? This past week, uh, I was watching uh, a clip of a movie on YouTube, and it was clear that this movie was made in the 60s. It was a woman, she was an older woman, and she was dressed all in black, a black dress. She had a black hat on, she had a black veil, and she was walking up the steps of her home, which was enormous. It was like a palace of a house. And she gets inside, and she's inside her living room, which is more like a parlor. I think that's what you call it when a house is that big, right? Uh, and there's a man who's sitting in an armchair with his back to her. And he says something to her and he stands up and he turns around and he starts to walk toward her. And he's, he is speaking quietly to her. It seems like she's shocked that he's there, but she has an idea of who he is. She understands that this, she recognizes him, right? This is somebody that she's met before. And as he walks over to her and he's speaking to her quietly, mid-sentence, pow, he punches her in the face. <laughs> he punches this old woman in the face. Uh, what do you make of that? What do you make of that clip? <laughs> See, we make assumptions, I think, immediately about the plot of that movie, about the characters, about who the hero is, about who the villain in that scene is, right? Clearly, this woman is an innocent victim, she is a mourner coming from a funeral. She's elderly. Uh, this man is lying in wait to attack her. He's trying to steal something from her, maybe steal her jewelry and get out of there. But the context, the context makes a massive difference. It changes the meaning of the clip, right? See, if we knew the plot, if we knew the characters, we would understand much better what's actually going on. The man who's sitting in the chair is none other than an English MI6 agent named Bond. <laughs> James Bond. 007. And the woman in the clip is actually the villain from the film. He's dressed up. He's put on some amazing technological mask to make him look like an old woman. Uh, and he's trying to make his getaway at the scene, the end, the conclusion of the film. Uh, context changes everything, right? It changes what we think about the characters, who the hero and who the villain are. 
We often, though, don't just do this when it comes to movie clips or TV shows. We have a tendency to do this when it comes to clips and scenes in the Bible, right? We have a tendency to approach the Bible like it were a series of unrelated clips that have no context. We come to a passage, maybe it's a promise, it's a command, it's a poem, it's a piece of narrative, and we make a judgment call about what it means right there, right then for us today. We take the clip, we take the scene, we run it through our personal story, we run it through our cultural understanding, we read it through our Western lenses. And this happens, I think, with greater frequency when we encounter difficult texts. You already heard a little bit about where we're headed this morning. Texts that seem to point us toward a violent God. Texts that seem to point toward cultural values that are outdated for us today. Texts that seem uh, to point to a reality that maybe God isn't actually good. When we encounter those texts, we have a couple of options. We could go in the direction where we say, ah, this is just a little bit too hard. I think what I'll do is I'll skip over this. I'll get to the good stuff, right? We'll get to David's anointing. That's a good part, right? Let's skip over this text, maybe sweep it under the rug, ignore it, try and explain it away. Another option we have is to try and fit it into the narrative that we already believe about the world. Maybe you've had a very difficult experience with organized religion, with the church, And you fit this into your narrative and you say, see, God is not good. Christians are not good. The Bible is outdated. It's antiquated. It's violent. However you have a tendency to approach these difficult texts, I think the temptation for all of us is to pluck the clip, to pull it out of its context, and to try to make sense of it without the broader story of what God is doing in the world. Our temptation is to choose to follow and obey some of what God says and to leave the stuff that's too tough, right? Our temptation is to say, I know how to live my life. I know how to live my story better than God would know. I'd rather stick with my plan than have faith in yours, God. The story that we're encountering this morning, it's It's one of those difficult passages. It's violent. It's confusing. My hope here is not that we're going to answer answer all the the questions that come with it. There's some good resources for that. But my hope would be that, one, we can put this clip back into the context of the broader biblical story. And two, that it would encourage all of us to put our faith in the God who is governing history toward a phenomenal conclusion. So let's pray, and then we're going to jump into this text. Uh, Lord, we need you. Every hour we need you. We need you as we come to a text in 1 Samuel 15 that's confusing. It can be tough to, to wade into these waters. We pray that your Holy Spirit, who inspired these words so long ago, would inspire us to faith and action as we read these words today. Meet us here in this text. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I'm Keith. I'm one of the pastors here at Redemption Church. Uh, we have been going through a series in 1 Samuel, and uh, today we're in 1 Samuel 15. If you need a Bible, don't be shy. Raise your hand, even if you left your Bible at home and you just want to have a copy to, to hang on to while we go through the text this morning. Raise your hand, and one of our ushers will bring a copy of God's Word to you. If you don't own a copy of God's Word, this is our gift to you. Keep it. Uh, también tenemos en español. Si necesita una copia en español, por favor, levanta la mano y diga español. Uh, si no tiene una copia, uh, este es nuestro regalo a usted. We are in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, as I said, uh, and it's been in a series called We Want a King, which walks through Israel's first three kings. We're on number one, a guy named Saul. We've already passed his peak moment in the, in the story. Uh, Chapter 11, which is his first big victory where he is crowned as king, that's his peak. It's all downhill from there. We see that quickly. We move into chapters 13 and 14, and Saul has the arrogance, he has the pride to think that he can offer a sacrifice as though he were a priest. He is condemned. And then it comes to this text here in verse 15, or in chapter 15, and we're wondering, does Saul have 
what it takes to redeem himself. Maybe, maybe he can get a second chance, right? Look what it says in verse 1 of chapter 15. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. So Samuel's saying, listen up. This is your last shot. Listen and obey. God is going to speak to you. You got one more shot here. Is Saul going to live up to this challenge? This is where we start to struggle. (laughs) This is where it starts to get tough for us with our Western lenses, with our Western story. Verse 2 and 3 say this. this is, these are the words of the Lord of hosts. I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Ugh. What is going on here? That seems pretty gruesome. Without context, I think it's really easy for us to miscast the hero and the villain like we do with the Bond clip, right? God is commanding Israel, it seems like, to a totally unprovoked attack on an innocent, defenseless people and commit genocide. That really is what it seems like is happening here in this text. So let's try and make sense of this, okay? Our first question as we approach this has to be, who are the characters? Who is the hero And who is the villain? So Amalek. We first encounter Amalek or the Amalekites. Amalek is the name of the city. The Amalekites are the people. We first encounter them in Exodus chapter 17. And this is a story where the people of God have been delivered from Egypt. Remember, they were in the yoke of slavery. They had been enslaved for 400 years by the Egyptians. And God sent Moses as a deliverer, and he delivered them out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. They're free from their bondage, but now they're in the wilderness. They're in the desert, right? Um, They've departed Egypt, but now they're defenseless. They're unshackled from their chains, but now they're unarmed. They're tired. They're hungry. And in step the Amalekites. They see their opportunity to strike. They surround the people of Egypt on all sides, and it says that they attack them in an unprovoked manner. Now remember, the people of Israel, they are not trained for combat. They were brick makers. They were slaves. They don't even know how to make weapons, let alone have weapons with them. They're utterly and totally defenseless. They don't have an army to protect them. This is men, women, and children who are being attacked without warning, without being provoked. So Amalek's goal is clear, to pillage and plunder and rape, to steal and kill and destroy. They want to conquer. God, however, steps in. And the story goes that Moses, whenever he lifts his hands in the air, uh, the Israelites win the battle, but whenever his hands fall down, they start to lose the battle. And so two of uh, Moses' men hold his hands up and they end up winning the battle. But it's miraculous. It's a miraculous victory. They're not soldiers. God wins the battle for them. But we read that in Numbers and Judges, the Amalekites do not change their ways. Even though they've been defeated in this battle, they continue the pattern of unprovoked attacks against their defenseless neighbors. And God, even though he wins the victory, says, I will remember their war crimes. I will remember what they did to my people as they came up out of Egypt. But what about Israel? I mean, surely hundreds of years have passed now. Aren't they a well-trained militia now? Well, no. Remember two chapters earlier, what happens is uh, they're trying to organize their army and they say that there's only two men in the entire nation that have swords. It's Saul and Jonathan, okay? So this is not a well-organized militia. Uh, This is not the story of the playground bully Israel going to beat up the innocent kid Amalek after school. This is the story of God coming to the aid and the rescue of the kid that's always getting bullied. The next question then that we have to ask about this passage is about the language of it, right? Right? What does devote to destruction really mean? Because that's really tough for us when we read that today. 
Josh Butler, who's the lead pastor at Redemption Church Tempe, he wrote a great book called The Skeletons in God's Closet, like God has skeletons in his closet. Um, It's a great resource. I would recommend it. I'm pulling a lot of information from there. Um, But what he calls this is he calls it ancient trash talk. Ancient trash talk. So imagine with me, this might be hard to imagine, uh, the U of A this fall is so good at football (laughs) that when they play ASU uh, in the fall, that they win such a decisive victory, right? They just absolutely dominate them. (laughs) Don't boo me. They don't, they dominate them, right? And then after the game, they interview some of the players and the players are like, we destroyed them. They couldn't get anything past us, right? They couldn't get a single first down. They never moved the chains. We hear that. And if we're interpreting that literally, we're thinking, man, the score was 84 to zip, right? They couldn't move the ball a yard. It was absolute domination. But would you be surprised, would you call them liars, if the final score was 77 to 7? (laughs) Sorry, Elliot. Uh, Would would that be a lie if the final score was 77 to 7? ASU scored a touchdown. They said that they couldn't get anything past them, right? No, we wouldn't call those players liars. We would say that they're trash talkers, right? They're talking trash. And that's exactly the same thing that's happening here in the ancient context. Ancient armies love to talk trash about how they dominate in victory. I'll give you a couple examples here. This is from Paul Copen. He wrote a great book about this. Uh, He says, uh, Egypt claimed in a great battle of the 15th century BC that they annihilated totally the great opposing army of Mitanni within the hour, exter- within the hour, exterminating them fully to make them like those not existent. In actuality, however, the great army of Mitanni continued to fight on and cause Egypt trouble for more than a century to come. They didn't wipe them out. They didn't annihilate them. Let's skip to the Moabite example there, Mike. The Moabites beat Israel in battle in the 8th century BC and made the outrageous genocidal claim that as a nation, Israel has utterly perished for always. In actuality, however, Israel lived on as a sovereign nation for a long time to come. This was simply a declaration of victory in battle. What we see here in this language of devote to destruction, even in a command, It's ancient trash talk. Go win and win in a decisive manner. But what about all the innocent civilians in the city? That's a good question. We have to engage in that one. Cities in the ancient Near Eastern context are not like the cities we think of today in our Western story. We think of the city of Tucson. We think of Safford School. We think of Banner Hospital, right? We think of a massive urban population center filled with civilians. That's not what a city in the ancient context was. A city in the ancient Near East was actually more like a fortress, a military stronghold. Here's what Copen says about Jericho and Ai, two of the most famously destroyed cities from Joshua. He says this, all the archaeological evidence indicates that no civilian populations existed at Jericho, Ai, and other cities mentioned in Joshua. Let me just say that again. All the archaeological evidence indicates that no civilian populations existed in these cities. Jericho was a small settlement of probably 100 or fewer soldiers. That's why Israel could circle it seven times and then do battle against it in the same day. They're not going all the way around the city of Tucson in one day, seven times, right? It's a small fortress that houses soldiers. So why the language about women and children, infants, donkeys, camels, et cetera, et cetera? There probably weren't any in the city of Amalek. The language here uh, is a metaphor that's used in Hebrew poetry, Hebrew literature. It's a way to say everybody, everyone that's present. So when they list it out, they say men and women, children and infants. It's got a rhythm to it, right? It's kind of poetic language. Men and women, children and infants, sheep and camels and donkeys, right? It's, it's a way for them to say everybody that's there. We don't say it that way, but that's the way that the Hebrew people would have said it. So really, when our Western lenses 
compel us to read this text and to cast Israel in the part of imperial power that's committing genocide, we're reading that into the text. In actuality, this story is the story of God asking a ragtag group of unorganized, lightly armed farmers to take down the brutal warlords in their region. Ooh, does that make this text any easier to swallow now? I don't think it makes it a lot easier, maybe a little bit, adding context. But what we have to do is we have to pull that clip out of our Western story. We have to pluck it out of our context. And we have to place it back in the biblical story in order for us to understand even a little bit of what's going on here. It's not just a temptation for us, though, to pull the clip out of God's word and to fit it into our context. We'll see in the story that that's exactly what Saul does as well. He hears God's word, and he's tempted to take just a little bit, a little snippet, and to fit it into his cultural narrative. Here's Saul's story. We see that in uh, the coming verses, Saul carries out the attack on the military stronghold, the city Amalek, and he says, I won that victory decisively. I devoted it to destruction. But it seems like there might be a problem with what happened here. Let's skip down to verse 8. Verse 8 says this, And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So there's a couple major departures that Saul makes from his instructions, right? The first major departure is that he takes Agag, the king of Amalek, alive. Is this an act of mercy? Maybe Saul is really kind. Maybe he's changing, right? No, this isn't an act of mercy. This is an act of pride, What Saul's doing here is that he wants to be a king like the the kings of the nations around him. And when the kings of the nations surrounding Israel conquer another tribe, they take the king of that tribe, they make them their slave, they gouge out their eyes, they put them behind them, and they parade them around like a trophy. Saul wants a trophy, not mercy. He takes Agag to show everyone how great he's done in battle. Here's the second major departure that he makes. He leaves the best of the sheep and the oxen and the cows and the lambs. Remember, everything. That means everything. He takes the best of everything. This is Hebrew language. Everything good, all the good stuff he takes. Was this an act of kindness uh, toward animals? Was he trying to, uh, to be merciful towards all these livestock? No. What Saul wants is he wants the spoils of war. He wants the victory spoils. He doesn't care about the worthless stuff. Remember, it says that in there. He doesn't care about the junk. He destroys that. He wants the best meat. He wants the best cows. He wants the best sheep because he wants to throw a huge block party, a huge barbecue in his honor, right? And if there's any doubt that this is what he's trying to do, Let's just look at what it says in verse 12. Someone rats Saul out. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told to Samuel, this is the rat, this is the narc, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Saul set up a statue in his honor to commemorate his great victory in battle. The trophy and the spoils weren't enough. He was bold enough to set up a statue to his strength, to his victory, to his glory, and then to take the trip down to Gilgal, which is the place that's known that has a monument set up to God's strength, to God's victory, to God's glory. Samuel gets in his face about this. Saul comes up to him and he's like, I did what you asked. And then you hear, bah, bah. <laughs> Samuel's like, hey, what's that? I hear sheep. What's going on back there? Well, I defeated the army, but Agag, I took him back with me. 
Uh, and there was some good meat that I didn't want to just leave lying around. So I took some sheep back with me too. You know, I was trying to, you know what I was trying to do, Samuel, is I was actually, I was trying to set up a sacrifice to your God. I was trying to set up a big sacrifice. And Samuel just flat out tells him, you've actually disobeyed God. Your partial obedience is flat out disobedience. And look how Saul responds to him in verse 20. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Saul straight up blames the people he's meant to lead. He throws them under the bus. God is going to hold leaders accountable and responsible. He's going to hold leaders accountable when they lead their people astray. If I stand up here and I preach a message to you that leads you to sin, God will hold me accountable. God cares and he will pay attention when leaders lead their people in the wrong way direction. But Saul, Saul pushes his responsibility, his accountability off onto his people. He pushes it even onto God. Remember, he says, this was just all for, to sacrifice to the Lord your God, Samuel. This is God's fault. He's the one who asked me to do this. Samuel wa- or Saul wants the spoils of war. He wants the feast. He wants the trophy. He wants the monument. He wants the honor. He wants all of the glory, but he wants none of the responsibility. And the core problem is that Saul is completely overrun with pride. Completely overrun with pride. He decided that some of God's command to him was unreasonable. It was outdated. It didn't fit with the cultural norms of the kings that he's watching around him. He decided that ultimately he knew better than God. And he masked his disobedience with religious language. I'll just sacrifice these sheep that I plundered. And I hate to admit it, but we do this too. I do this. I'm prone to picking and choosing which parts of God's word I'd like to pay attention to, that I'd like to listen to. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, that's sweet. Love your enemies. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you. Yay! It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Ooh. He'll rejoice over you with loud singing. Let no corrupting talk come from your mouths, but only that which is good for building others up. See, the reality is we're not that much different from Saul. We like God's word when it benefits us. We don't like it so much when it costs us something. And Saul wants us to know he paid the cost He sacrificed those animals to God. Isn't that good enough? Look what he says in verse 22, what Samuel replies to him. He says, Has the Lord as great delight in in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Listening is better than the fat of rams. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And in this case, obedience was actually more expensive to Saul than sacrifice. It cost him something. His sacrifice cost him nothing. It was plunder. It was loot. His obedience would have cost him his glory. His partial obedience was flat out disobedience. It was rebellion against the word of the Lord. It was Saul saying, I know better than you know. Saul took a clip. He took a scene of God's word And he made it fit into the context of his story, into his agenda. He cut out God's story. And in doing so, he cut out God. Let's finish the story by remembering 
the trajectory of what God's story is. Let's look at verse 28. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. So the reign of Saul is coming to an end. It seems like it just started. Uh, But this second act of pride has sealed Saul's fate. Another man's going to be king in his stead. Uh, The text doesn't leave us in mystery long. Uh, We find out in just, we'll find out next week as we go into 16 who that man is. It's the beginning of the story of a guy named David. But the trajectory of God's story points us further. It points us beyond David. It points us to another king. It points us to a king who will succeed where Saul fails. It points us to a king who will come in humility. It points us to a king who will submit to the will of God, even if he doesn't want to. Not my will, but your will be done. He's not going to throw his people under the bus and blame them, but instead he's going to take the blame for them. He's not going to spare the enemy in an effort to parade them around. He is going to crush the head of the serpent once and for all. See, the trajectory of God's plan points us to King Jesus. The story of Saul's failures ought to drive us toward the story of Jesus' victories. The weird thing is this story doesn't end with just Samuel declaring that um, there's going to be another king, that Saul's reign is going to end. It ends with another tough passage. And it would be pretty hypocritical of me to stand up here and say we'd like to skip over tough passages and then to skip over it. So we're going to go there. It ends with this in verses 32 and 33. Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. He doesn't know what's coming. Agag Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Woof. Why does the story end here? (laughs) It reads like some gruesome chapter from like a Game of Thrones novel or something. The reason it ends here is because the trajectory of God's plan points us to a final day that will be free from injustice. That's why it ends here. See, Agag is a warlord. We have to remember who the characters are. Agag has probably hacked his fair share of people into pieces. Samuel declares that there are many women who have lost their children at the hands of Agag, the warlord. God hears the cries of the oppressed. God hears the cries of the murdered. Agag's sword cannot silence them. God has a plan to rid his kingdom of injustice forever. The trajectory of God's plan points us to a final day, a last day, when no injustice will remain in his kingdom. God's plan, the trajectory of God's plan, points us to a final day when he will banish oppression for good. The trajectory of God's plan points us to a final day when the curse of sin, the curse of death, the curse of evil will be done and dusted. And when that day comes, and it will come, King Jesus himself will close the book on bullying. King Jesus will close the book on unprovoked attacks. He will close the book on racial hatred and injustice. He will close the book on murder. He will close the book on war crimes. He will close the book on genocide. Jesus will have the last word, folks. That's good news. 
Here's the last word that he's going to have. Revelation 21, 5 says this. He who is seated on the throne, remember, this is the king. This is King Jesus. He says, behold, I am making all things new. He also said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. After King Jesus frees the world, rids the world, cures the world from injustice and oppression and evil, he's going to sit down and begin the business of making all things new, making all things good again, fixing everything that's broken. And he asks one thing of us. Will you and I believe and trust that his plan is trustworthy and true. That's what he asks of us. So I will leave you guys with this question. Which story will you live in this morning? Let's pray. King Jesus, come soon. The world is filled with injustice. The world is filled with uh, hatred, It's filled with pain. It's filled with the curse of sin. And we cannot wait until that final day that you come to free this world from its bondage to sin and injustice and evil. Come soon, Lord Jesus. We're so thankful that you are not a a king like Saul that desires to lift himself up to show the world how great you are in a way that Um, is just to take of all the spoils, but you lift yourself up to show the world how great you are so that we can come freely to you. Jesus, we pray that many would come freely to you. Thank you for taking the blame for us. Thank you that you are a better king, that you are the true king, and that you will sit on your throne and reign over this earth forever and ever. In your name we pray, amen.